Hey guys, welcome back. This week, Cannon Fodder has reached 50 issues, which is actually pretty awesome. And as promised last week, the new issue has a ton to offer, so let's get right into it. The issue opens with a fairly extensive look at the development cycle for Halo 5 from lead writer Brian Reed. Regardless of your feelings of the guy in Halo 5, it's an insightful read with tons of interesting bits. As an example, we've known for a while that Thorne was originally meant to be on Fireteam Osiris, but at one point, Majestic as a whole was going to be the team sent after the Chief. However, the dev team decided that a purpose-built group would work better, and Thorne was instead relegated to a member of what would eventually become Fireteam Osiris. Unfortunately, scheduling issues meant Thorne's voice actor was unavailable, and Buck was eventually chosen to replace him. The section is fairly long and goes on with other bits of behind-the-scenes details that were pretty damn awesome to read about. Again, regardless of your feelings of the final product, if you like a peed at the development process, give it a proper read. If you want additional details, today also saw the release of the next episode of The Sprint. The episode takes a look at the development of Osiris, the campaign and story, Warzone, the game's launch, and so much more. It's hard to believe they fit it all into a single 20-minute episode. For me, though, the highlight was a peek at an upcoming visual guide known as Halo Mythos, currently slated for fall of next year. Referred to as the Big Book at one point, and said to cover everything from the Forerunners to the end of Halo 5, I think we can safely expect a book that rivals the size and scope of the Halo Encyclopedia, hopefully with better editing. 2016 is going to be a good year one way or another. Moving forward, the next section gives us a look at the two new armor sets being included with the upcoming Battle of Shadow and Light update. First up is Shinobi Armor, which strangely looks more like Samurai Armor, but I digress. The armor was discovered on a derelict freighter near Lakale 9352, a real star, by the way. It's small beans, but I really love getting actual locations like this. Halo used to do it all the time, but sadly drifted away from that trend after Eric Nyland stopped writing. Anyway, the armor set has no known manufacturer or intended user, though if you recall Halsey's personal journal, or if you don't, she did note that there were other programs out there trying to replicate her work with the Spartans and Mjolnir. We also had Project Hayabusa in Halo 3, and while the canonicity is debatable, it does lend credence to the idea that there may have been secret private sector projects trying to replicate the Spartans and or Mjolnir. Oni continues to probe the recovered armor, though the suits remain cryptic black boxes with several levels of restricted functionality. Despite risks, Oni has authorized limited testing of the Shinobi armor. So... cryptic. I wonder what these levels of restricted functionality might be, and if they might hint at abilities 343 are cooking up for future Halo titles. Probably not, but it's a nice canon fallback. Next up is Tracer, a suit that takes the capability of the Engineer and Tracker suits and combines their operational capabilities into a single armor set. The helmet contains a Tier 3 data core noted as being the first of its kind and far more advanced than any other found in earlier Gen 2 armors. After that, we get a few community questions. The first asks for the name of the Marathon-class cruiser destroyed in Halo 2 by Day of Jubilation. The cruiser, somewhat ironically, was called UNSC Feeling Lucky and served with 5th Fleet. The second question asks how exactly did Jewel lose control of the Prometheans? According to Grimm, Jewel's control was based on the influence and intent of the Didact, which I can safely say that many of us figured. Makes me once again wish that Jewel had been present during the Didact's awakening. Really would have tied things together. Anyway, by the time they arrived at Kamchatka, the Prometheans were under a new influence. Once again, as one would figure, but it's always good to have confirmation. Next, we get a two-parter asking one if we'll ever get to see the Decimator class of Mjolnir, and two if spy armor is still in use. Grimm notes that Decimator will appear in Halo 5, and that while spy armor has largely been phased out, the photoreactive plating, the tech that allowed spy to cloak, has seen limited but successful use with Spec Ops ODST units. Funny, since I used to refer to spy armor as advanced ODST armor. Anyway, the final question asks about who was leading the Covenant during the Battle of Sunion. Grimm notes that while several Sangheili commanders presided, one that can be identified was a general named Kitun Arak. According to some accounts, this general stormed a hill on Kamchatka with the aid of Fireteam Osiris. Now, interestingly, this actually relates to a particular achievement in Halo 5 where you do indeed help a Sangheili general storm a hill. If you get him to the top, he'll actually become your ally. I don't really have footage to show since it's a fairly difficult task even on easy, but the one time I did accomplish it, for the achievement of course, me and my teammates ended up killing poor Kitun before we realized he'd joined our cause. Oops. Now, the final section will be, or has been, a highlight for many. Over the years, there have been several documents that help flesh out backstories in small areas of the universe. From the data drops, to conversations from the universe, to the Halo 3 terminals, there's tons of stuff out there that many fans are unaware of, and in some cases, are really, really hard to track down. Well, today, Grimm is undoubtedly happy to announce a new section of the Halo Universe section on Halo Waypoint, known as the Oni Files. This will serve as a collection of such documents and canon sources. 
While Halopedia is always useful, you have to know what you're looking for to find it. It'll be nice to have a single source to refer to for a lot of these files. Check out the full offering and keep your eyes open for additions. Myself and other lore fanatics have certainly identified some much needed additions already. Closing out the article, Grimm announces a giveaway for some awesome Halo 5 swag. Copies of Halo 5, the original soundtrack, books, and Mega Bloks are all up for grabs. To enter for a chance to win, tweet at GrimmBrother1 using the hashtag CanonFodder and state your favorite aspect of the Halo fiction. You can also post in the discussion thread for this issue, which I've linked below, for an additional entry. And with that, we end the main article and come to the new universe entries. This week we have the Powered Assault Armor Mjolnir, the Oni Research Facility known as Argent Moon, and the T-55 Ultra Heavy Siege Tower, or Kraken. Starting out with Mjolnir, there's not really much to talk about if you've already read the books, though mainly Fall of Reach. Mjolnir was the second half of Halsey's Spartan II program, her work slightly piggybacking off combat exoskeletons of the past, though Halsey's Mjolnir was a whole different beast. The exoskeletons had three marks before Mjolnir came along, hence why the first iteration of Mjolnir was called Mark IV. These exoskeletons were bulky and didn't see much use on the battlefield. The first two marks had to be tethered to an immobile power supply, and while Mark III saw limited battlefield use, it had to remain in range of an immobile broadcast power generator. Halsey's Mjolnir completely overhauled the designs, resulting in a powered assault platform that greatly amplified the user's abilities without any hindrances, other than it could only be used by augmented personnel. Each mark thereafter improved upon the previous iteration, though upgrades and permutations first introduced in the original Mark IV platform remained in use during and after the Covenant War, a testament to its design. Mark V introduced energy shields and the ability to carry an AI, further enhancing a Spartan's capabilities. Mark VI further improved on these and other abilities of the armor, and included built-in biofoam injectors in case of medical emergencies. Mark VII saw very limited use, but included limited energy shield manipulation technology, along with a nanotech repair suite. By 2553, the UNSC had shifted production of Mjolnir to the Gen 2 platforms. Using a spiral development model, the UNSC and its partners could iterate and evolve the armor systems much faster than before. Funny enough, this model was basically what Halsey had originally intended for Mjolnir, but the limited amount of operators and budget, along with UNSC standards at the time, forced her to stick to the tiered mark system we've come to know. Next up is Argent Moon, an Oni research station that was, among other projects, producing a weaponized biological agent that could be distributed among a population before being activated by an otherwise harmless aerosol dispersant. Called Asteroidia, quarantine was broken, resulting in the total death of the crew. The station's AI then put it on a course that would avoid risking infecting others before eventually initiating final dispensation. In 2558, the ship was found by KGR scavengers and sold to Julem Damas Covenant before being discovered by the UNSC. Interestingly, the article notes that the ship was destroyed on October 23rd, finally giving us a date for Halo 5's second level. Now we just need one for the first level, and we're set. We close out with the Kraken, a mobile siege tower rather than an excavator like many, myself included, had once thought. Origins unknown, the Kraken is usually deployed from a capital ship in sub-orbit. Once on the ground, the Kraken can be set enemy positions, deploy strike forces, and physically rip apart enemy structures. Though some records would indicate that the Kraken may have been deployed during the Covenant War, it remained uncatalogued until 2555. The common belief is that the machines were based on a variant of Forerunner Sentinel used during the fight with the Flood. When Jewel was trying to build up his own forces, he looked upon a few of the siege towers, though would often use them sparingly to avoid tipping his hand. In 2558, they finally saw real deployment on Kamchatka and Sankhelios, part of the Covenant's final stand in both cases. And that wraps this week up. Grimm wasn't lying when he said there's quite a lot to discuss this week, and the video would have been a lot longer if we'd gone into each file included with the Oni files, which, again, do check out. There's a lot there that was once hard to find or only available through limited means. Before we go, I'm currently working on my Halo The Fall of Reach animated series review, so look forward to that this week. All the footage and audio is captured, so it's just editing at this point. Until then, this has been Halo Cannon, and hopefully my next video won't be another cannon fodder. Hey guys, thanks for watching. If you liked this video, please consider giving it a thumbs up, subscribing, and sharing it around. You are the reason I get to keep doing this, so thank you, profusely thank you. If you want to dive deeper into Halo's lore, head over to the Halo Archive. It's a lore-based community that welcomes everyone from experts to rookies. No matter what your working knowledge, you'll be sure to find a friend and a good time.